I really would like to make this topic that you are not your brain, that you have a brain as light and as fun and as fascinating as it could be and take it out of the realm of it being something grave or serious. I think what it represents is a opportunity for a freedom and a release because that's what the truth always does. It always sets us free and gives us release, gives us uh, hope, encouragement, a sense of the best is not only now, but yet to be. So this notion that, again, two diametrically opposed ways of looking, the modern scientific approach that your brain, the interaction of your brain, your brain is a mushy ball of kind of oatmeal consistency with just the right combination of chemicals and elect electrical stimulation that kind of pops your consciousness into view. And it does that until you croak. And then the brain is worm food and its job is done. No more consciousness. On the other hand, I'm talking about brain as filter or I believe in equally uh, accurate metaphor is receiver. So when you really cultivate and begin to understand and then actually experience that your own brain is a receiver and that it can be tuned to various frequencies. Now, if we don't le learn to tune our own brain, just, you know, imagine a stereo that's just turned on in a random room with random people constantly flipping the dial and spinning it all around, it's going to be chaos. It's going to be a hodgepodge. It's going to be quite random. There'll be no coherence to it. Sound like anybody you know? On the other hand, the recognition that I, I have a brain, I am a spiritual being, and I'm living a material existence, a worldly existence, and I was endowed with a glorious and beautiful, a great and magnificent gift, which is a brain, which has a nervous system attached to it. And that under the right circumstances and with the right discipline and understanding and practice, my brain can be tuned to a variety of different frequencies, just like any receiver or any TV set or any radio. And one of the ways that we're motivated to find some of the better channels and receive some of the better signals is by receiving some of the crappy ones. So in other words, when we were little kids, perhaps we were chronically trained, habituated to tune into stations or uh, channels of fear, worry, dread, overanalyzing, um, worry, impending doom, jealousy, not enough, scarcity, but obviously the, the, the most damaging ones are fear, unworthiness, and anger. Those are the three that are such insidious and pernicious things to be trained to receive. And once, they, once our receiver becomes habituated into receiving that, then everything that we see becomes, becomes justification of it. It builds a momentum of its own. Once we are fearful, everything that we see, our brain turns it into scary. If we're habitually angry, if we're tuned into the anger channel, everything that we see is angry and frustrating. If we're unworthy or guilty or ashamed of ourselves, everything that we see makes us feel less than, not, not good enough. We're never going to make it, that we're losers. And this is the glory of the brain that we've been, we've been given simply put to hideous use. Now, a modern neuroanatomist, and seriously, up until about 50 years ago, they said that the initial programming, the way that the brain was shaped early on, was pretty much it. So talk about a grim diagnosis. Not only are you the product of the electrochemical goings-on inside of your mushy brain, once that's shaped, and it's mostly shaped by the time you're about seven, the time over which you have essentially zero control, 
you are, that's who you are. And the likelihood of you changing is, well, zero. Now in the succeeding 50 years with MRIs and the awakening of science and more open-minded researchers, neuroplasticity has been discovered, but it's still, it's still nothing in relation to the neuroplasticity that's actually available when you begin to recognize that you are a spiritual being who has a material brain and your material brain can be tuned. And if you don't tune it, someone else will. If you don't, if you don't consciously and deliberately cleanse, purify, refine, and then accurately tune your own receiver so that you receive a beautiful, loving, harmonious, and glorious picture of reality, which is available to everyone, then what's left is something that's degrading, depressing, demoralizing, and vastly less than what it could be. The good news is we're all going to croak and we're going to shed these brains. And these brains, which are filters, which take an infinite resource, consciousness, and filter it down really to a trickle. Even those of us who can tune our brains into love and joy and peace and bliss, that's wonderful. But in relation to the volume that's available, our brains are valves and they squeeze it down to such a small quantity. When we die, we're not any less alive. We're just no longer constrained by the filter of our brain. That's why so many people who come back from near-death experiences, they talk about it's as if they were seeing one ten trillionth of existence when they were alive. When they shed their mind, their body, their nervous system, suddenly there was no filtration. There was no there was no diminishment. There was no squeezing going on. So as meditators, we're cleaning our brain every day. And through prayer and through good thinking, and then, of course, following it up with good action, we find the continuum of becoming expert brain tuners and using this magnificent tool, which doesn't create consciousness. We have to get over that terrifying superstition that our brain makes consciousness our brain receives it. And then when we're sufficiently disabused of that notion, we can set about the continuum of meditation, prayer, and action that makes our brain into the most beautiful and refined tool. And then you can see the kingdom of heaven that's spread out all about us that most don't see, but you will. And then you'll show others how to do it. All right, we'll continue.